A reading from the book of Genesis. The Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to till it and keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, you may eat freely of every tree of the garden, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat of it, you shall die. Now the serpent was more crafty than any other wild animal that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, Did God say you shall not eat from any tree in the garden? The woman said to the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden. But God said, You shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the middle of the garden, nor shall you touch it, or you shall die. But the serpent said to the woman, you will not die, for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was a delight to the eyes and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. And she also gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate. Then the eyes of both were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made loincloths for themselves. Later, they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden at the time of the evening breeze, and the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man and said to him, Where are you? He said, I heard the sound of you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, and I hid myself. He said, Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree of which I commanded you not to eat? The man said, The woman who you gave to be with me, she gave me fruit from the tree, and I ate. Then the Lord God said to the woman, What is this that you have done? The woman said, The serpent tricked me, and I ate. The Lord God said to the serpent, Because you have done this, cursed are you among all animals and among all wild creatures. Upon your belly you shall go, and dust you shall eat all the days of your life. And the Lord God made garments of skins for the man and for his wife and clothed them. Then the Lord God said, See, the man has become like one of us, knowing good and evil. And now he might reach out his hand and take also from the tree of life and live forever. Therefore, the Lord God sent him forth from the Garden of Eden to till the ground from which he was taken. He drove out the man, and at the east of the Garden of Eden he placed the cherubim and a sword flaming and turning to guard the way to the tree of life. Hear what the Spirit is saying to God's people. Thanks be to God. I come to you in the name of God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. When I was a kid, there were five words that my parents would often say that really frustrated me. Any guesses as to what those words might have been? I bet you may have heard them yourselves a time or two. Here they are. Because I told you so. Why can't I ride my bicycle from Flora to Louisville all by myself? Because I told you so. Why can't I stay up all night playing Mario Brothers on a school night? Because I told you so. Why can't I jump from the trampoline to the swimming pool? Or even better, jump off the roof to the trampoline and then into the swimming pool? Because I told you so. These were all things that, by the way, I eventually did without hurting myself or others. At least not too much. You know, I used to think that because I told you so was the most unimaginative, 
lazy, good-for-nothing reason my parents could give for not allowing me to do something fun and interesting. And then I became a parent. And I came to understand that, actually, I was right. Because I told you so is kind of lazy and unimaginative. Now, don't get me wrong, I, I use those words a lot and they tend to work really well. Uh, because I told you so is an effective, time-honored way of slamming the brakes on the why not train. But generally, I only pull out those five words when I'm too tired or too cranky to give a well-reasoned explanation for my parental wisdom, or when I really can't come up with a good reason not to climb on top of the minivan to pick walnuts from the tree in the backyard, or not to take the chickens for a walk down Cherokee Street. You know, I've seen stranger things happen on Cherokee Street. This morning, we read one of the most iconic and well-known stories in our Holy Scriptures. The story of a tree, a snake, two naked people in a garden. And so often, interpreters of this ancient story have come away thinking that the God revealed in this primordial narrative is really quite unimaginative. A God who made an arbitrary rule about not eating one particular fruit. A rule that, if questioned or challenged, might have been justified with those five frustrating words, because I told you so. Why can't we eat the fruit, God? Because I told you so. Why can't we enjoy its sweetness, God? Because I told you so. Why do we have to abstain from this part of your creation, from a fruit that you, God, set in the middle of our garden? Uh, well, because I told you so. Not only does this reading of the text leave us with, a, with an unimaginative God who expels human beings from paradise for what seems like a minor infraction, it also leaves us with the impression that disobedience is the original sin and that disobeying, disobeying a seemingly arbitrary rule lies at the root of our brokenness. But I've, I've got a hard time believing all that. I don't believe that a tendency toward disobedience is necessarily our original sin. In fact, unquestioning compliance can, in some instances, prove more damaging than honest insubordination. And besides that, I don't believe that God is a because-I-told-you-so kind of parent. God is too imaginative for those five words. And I don't believe that one act of simple, simple disobedience would cause a God of infinite love to expel God's children from the garden, resulting in a history full of brokenness, disease, strife, and war. If that was the case, if that was the God we worship, then, then most of us, who've ever raised or are raising children would be kinder, more compassionate, and much more forgiving parents than our Creator. Now, please do not misunderstand me. Uh, this primordial story about a serpent, a garden, a forbidden fruit, and a naked man, and a naked woman reveals to us something fundamentally broken with humanity. But I'm not sure that that something is disobedience. I kind of think that maybe, just maybe, that something is humanity's propensity of trying to be like God, even though we most certainly are not. If you eat from this tree, you will be like God. That's the temptation. That's the problem. That's what the serpent says to the human. 
If you eat this apple or orange or who knows, this perfectly ripe avocado, you will be like God without limit. You will be transformed from a limited creature made in God's image to a limitless being with no need of a creator, redeemer, or sustainer. You will be able to define for yourself what is right and what is wrong with certainty, without ambiguity, and with self-righteous assurity. You will control your own destiny and find peace and security in your own infinite potential and self-sustainability. You will go from humble stewards to absolute monarchs of the garden. You might say, well, what's so bad about that? What's so sinful about all that? What's wrong with reaching toward human perfection? What's wrong with our quest for ethical precision and moral absolutism? What's wrong with seeking limitless human progression? Well, I'm not sure I'd say any of those things are moral failings or even sins as much as they are tragic mistakes with tragic consequences. That's what our ancestors learned back in Eden. Giving in to the temptation of trying to live without limits, of trying to be like God, was the reason for their expulsion and the source of their alienation from each other, the creation and their creator. Like most fundamental myths and origin stories, the one we read today isn't just about something that happened a long time ago in a garden far, far away. It happens all the time. As daughters of Eve and sons of Adam, we too are tempted to believe the serpent when it says, take and eat, and you will be like God, self-sustaining and without limits. And like our ancestors before us, we take the bite in pursuit of limitlessness, only to find ourselves expelled from Eden over and over again. Eating the forbidden fruit of limitless profit and exponential growth has expelled us from the garden of mutuality and cooperation and has left us in the wilderness of capitalistic greed and exploitation. Eating the forbidden fruit of limitless consumption has expelled us from the garden of abundance where everyone has enough because no one has too much and has left us in the wilderness of drought, famine, and pollution. Eating the forbidden fruit of limitless qualified immunity has expelled us from the garden of accountability and has left us in the wilderness of police brutality. Eating the forbidden fruit of limitless personal potential, strength, and ability, a limitlessness that ain't got no need for nobody because I can do it all by myself. Eating this fruit has expelled us from the garden of beloved community where burdens are shared and limits are accepted and has left us in the wilderness of burnout, guilt, and shame. And as we've seen ever so clearly over the past few years, Eating the forbidden fruit of limitless ability to discern with alleged certainty what is good and what is evil has expelled us from the garden of neighborliness, respect, and humility and has left us in the wilderness of uncharitable partisanship and animosity. We are not the Creator. We are the created. We are beautiful creations made in God's image, 
But we are not like God. We have limits. Some of these limits are aggravating, frustrating, painful, and downright depressing. But as our ancestors in the faith have tried to tell us time and time again, down throughout the centuries, the solution to our creaturely predicament is not to be better, or to do better, or to work harder and exceed our limits, or to eat the tempting and forbidden fruit of infinite human progress. Our solution, our salvation, is not found within ourselves at all. It's not found in our abilities or in our human potential for greatness. Our salvation is found in God. It's found in God's grace. A grace that allows us to be fully who we are, limits and all. A grace that frees us from the exhausting an unsustainable drive for perfection, self-reliance, and omnipotence. A grace that flows through us, teaching us to walk humbly and gently with neighbors and friends who also live with creaturely limitations. A grace that compels us to strive for justice and righteousness while simultaneously forgiving us when we miss our high and lofty goals. A grace that shows us the towers built to heaven won't get us closer to human perfection because heaven has already come down to us in the form of a person whom we call the new Adam who has made a way for our redemption. This grace, God's grace, invites us to, a, to place our securities, our lives, our futures, and our destinies into the hands of a limitless God of limitless love who shelters, clothes, and feeds us even after we've eaten the forbidden fruit and, fa and found ourselves living on the other side of Eden. And that grace, my friends, is available. It's available at the altar in this place in this community, in this world, at your home. It's not available to men and women without limits. But thanks be to God, it's available to creatures with limits, like us, made in God's image. Amen.